Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming out to this talk. I'm Yao Amber Lee, Assistant Professor of Economics from School of Business and Management at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. I'm also faculty associate <coughs> of uh, IEMS, Institute of Emerging Market Studies. Uh, today, we are delighted to return to the EY Central Office to continue our Emerging Market Insights series, which are presented by HKUST IEMS, co-organized by uh, HKUST Institute for Public Policy and also Center of Economic Development, sponsored by EY, in order to provide the thought leadership on important issues on emerging markets. Today, I'm honored to introduce our speaker, Professor Keith Maskus. Uh, Keith is an arts and science professor of distinction and also professor of economics at University of Colorado, Boulder, USA. He was also previously chief economist at the US uh, Department of the State, where he led the research and uh, analyst, uh, analysis on a very wide range of the topics on uh, international e economics and security topics, which are very important for the US uh, foreign policies. He was also the lead economist of the World Bank uh, in the past. He also serves as a consultant uh, for the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, and also the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, his current research focused on the international economic aspects of the in, uh, protecting intellectual property rights, which is a very key and sensitive issue in today's tension between US and China. Right? Um, now today, he will speak to us about US trade policies and also the US-Asian trade relationship. Now let's welcome Keith. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, and especially my thanks to Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and to EY. Uh, it's, uh, it's very nice to be here. I come to Hong Kong often, but uh, I don't think I've ever had this view before, so it's really great. I'll be looking out there <laughs> while trying to, to convince you of a few things. Um, so when I was uh, invited to come to Hong Kong and give a talk over at HKUST, uh, they also uh, then asked me to, to try to say a few words about about this topic, uh, which I'm, I'm happy to do. Uh, I know it's an extremely uh, important uh, and timely topic in this part of the world, but so it is uh, in, in the United States as well. So um, what I think that I will uh, try to do is, uh, is, is offer some, some comments that are mostly focused on what seems to be going on in the United States and whether the situation in the United States is more permanent or more temporary. Now in saying that, and, and then talk what it, about what it might mean for, for this part of the world, but in, in saying that, I do wanna let you know <laughs> a few things. Uh, first of all, about being the chief economist of the State Department, I, I was uh, in that position for a year through October of last year. Um, so, uh, one of the few economics officials in the first year of the Trump administration. Um, but as you probably have heard, uh, the State Department has been under some stress. <laughs> and among other things, what that means is there are no economists left at the State Department any longer, or scientists or technologists either. So it's a, it's, it's a little difficult to, to tell you these days what may be going on. Uh, in that context. And then I should be very clear that any comments I make today are my opinion uh, as a private citizen of the United States. Uh, you shouldn't take anything I say as a reflection of public policy in the United States whatsoever. Um, all right. Had I been here six months ago, that would be a different story. All right. So you've all seen the headlines from then candidate and now President Trump. I don't know if you have seen this one. This is from 2015. I'll just let you read this, uh, but it is 
without question, uh, part of the driving uh, impetus going on in, uh, in the Trump administration these days with respect especially to China. Now that was a campaign statement, so keep that in mind. It was kind of overstated. But we have the Trans-Pacific Partnership as another disaster done and pushed by special interests. If you know the rest of that quote, it gets pretty salty, as we say in English. So um, NAFTA is the worst trade deal maybe ever signed anywhere, but certainly ever signed by this country, this country meaning the United States. Um, and trade wars are good and easy to win. <laughs> I suspect that particular quote was not uh, vetted by the State Department. But uh, there it is. So this is really a very aggressive, in-your-face kind of dialogue, or, or, or maybe not dialogue, <laughs> unilateral conversation going on uh, in Washington these days. Um, and it, there's no question that it concerns a great many people there, maybe more there than here. I'll say uh, a, a fair amount about this pushback that, that's going on in the United States now. But before getting that there, what about some of the policy pronouncements that, uh, that has come out of the administration? Well, you know, the U.S. withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. First thing the Trump administration did was to announce its withdrawal from the TPP. Uh, I actually was recruited to the State Department by the prior administration, and uh, part of what I was going to be working on was uh, working with Congress to actually get the United States into the final stages of the TPP. So there was some significant shock in Washington uh, when the election came out the way it did, in this context at least. So the administration announced uh, in May of 2017 a study of the sources of bilateral trade deficits and the effects of unfair trade practices. That study uh, was written, I believe, but uh, I don't know that it's ever been released. Of course, the U.S., Mexico, and Canada, at, at the American insistence, launched a renegotiation of NAFTA in August. That is still going on. And the administration threatened to withdraw from the Korea-U.S. trade agreement in September, but uh, there was some minor renegotiation of that one. Uh, and maybe the most uh, significant one that gets the least number of headlines, uh, the U.S. investment rebody called CFIUS, or CFIUS, uh, surely is intervening more now to block technology acquisitions. The most famous one, of course, being just last month uh, with Broadcom and the Qualcomm arrangement being blocked by CFIUS. Um, and, you know, it pretty much entirely on the grounds of national security and the loss of in, in sensitive technology. Section 202, the National Security Steel Aluminum Tariffs announced in March 2018. This is a very significant uh, element of trade policy, not, not only because of the tariffs themselves, but because national security uh, as a motivation or justification for, for unilateral tariff setting in the, well, anywhere in the United States or elsewhere has pretty much uh, been taken off the table by the WTO agreements. Uh, and so this is, this is, in fact, a change in the norms um, of pretty significant dimension. The administration announced uh, an intention to impose tariffs, as you all know very well, on $60 billion of Chinese imports under Section 301. So the administration has also resurrected Section 301, the, uh, the unfair trade practices part of U.S. trade policy. Um, and again, that is something that has not been uh, undertaken by the United States uh, during the WTO period until this case. Um, the, RG, the idea being that Section 301, defining unilaterally what is an, an unfair international trade practice, should have been given deference to the WTO. Uh, but you know, the Trump administration thinks that's not significant or not enough uh, in terms of the toolbox that the Americans have. So this, of course, regards China, is, is in regards to China's restrictions on investment, uh, ownership versus joint venture requirements, intellectual property, its treatment, technology transfer restrictions, and, and all of those things that uh, you're familiar with. Um, 
And those tariffs, uh, as you know, have not been implemented. There's this sort of tit-for-tat set of threats going back and forth these days. Uh, we'll know in another month or so uh, what will happen there. Well, no matter how you slice it, <coughs> that's an impressive record of announcements, if uh, not always implemented or even very often implemented into actual policies. Uh, but it does suggest a real change in, in rhetoric and approach to international trade. And I wouldn't say uh, it's entirely aimed at China or Asia by any means. I mean, Canadians and the Mexicans are wondering, you know, what happened to their world uh, early on in the administration. Uh, and the Europeans, of course, were hit by the steel tariffs until they were able to get exceptions from the steel tariffs. So, uh, so this is uh, not, not uh, by any means targeted anywhere other than uh, thinking that the United States needs to be more aggressive about international trade. Which, for me, raises an interesting question, which is, is this a one-off administrative change? Uh, or are the American people really themselves turning inward? Uh, you know, we, we hear a lot about Brexit, for example, in, in the UK as an example of, of uh, populations getting tired of sort of elite trade arrangements being imposed upon them and immigration rules that come from abroad. Uh, and so there was some, uh, some dis dissatisfaction in Britain about their situation. So is that the same thing in the United States uh, is, is an excellent question, and I'll, I'll talk you through how I see it, but I uh, certainly could be wrong about this. Um, so how much does this policy trend reflect U.S. voter attitudes? This is a very complex question, and it's often caught up in debates about deep American political divisions that you may have heard about. I'll say a few things about that in a moment. But if I can show you something that might interest you, I'm going to come back to... Um, Oh, I guess I'm, I'm not there yet. So let's just go through the conventional anti-trade wisdom, which, which has a lot of truth to it. There's no, no doubt about it. Many American households in particular regions have suffered economic stagnation uh, for a long time. Until recently, there has been very little growth in average household real income for the bottom 60% of U.S. households, which is to say um, in 1978 or 9, uh, if you were in the bottom 60% of American households, your real income would be the same as it is today. Almost no difference. Uh, even accounting for sort of quality improvements in products and so on. And that's a, a pretty extraordinary event if you think about that. Um, that's a lot of people who think that they've seen the world grow but, but haven't themselves really participated as much in this. Trade is seen widely as a source of the sharp rise in inequality that we're all familiar with. Rightly or wrongly, that's, I think, a common perception. And of course, there have been major job losses in manufacturing and other blue collar work. Um, the chart was up there a second ago, but uh, from the peak in 1979 to the trough in 2010, uh, eight million jobs in manufacturing in the United States disappeared. Now, a lot of them have started to come back and a lot of people sort of uh, attribute that to, to the Trump administration. Um, whether that is a fair attribution or not is, is an interesting question. I mean, the economic growth that's been going on is really why that's being driven, but, uh, but you, can, you can tell a lot of political stories here. And maybe even more important, many locations suffered from pretty severe dislocation uh, from this import competition. So I went, just to give you an example, uh, to, to an undergraduate college in a small western town in the state of Illinois right in the middle of the country. Uh, when I was there as, in, as a college student in the late 1970s, it was a manufacturing center of considerable importance. Uh, but now there are no factories left there. Uh, the city is, is really quite devastated. Um, and people, you know, they look for reasons to, to, to blame for this. And international trade is certainly uh, one of them. And trade coming from China is uh, certainly at the top of that list. So as I say, it's easy to ascribe these problems to offshoring, emergence of production networks, and import growth from China. Uh, if I could give you another little anecdote. Um, sometime a few years ago, my wife and I were out shopping for a dishwasher, as I recall, and she was deep in negotiations with the guy who was selling us a dishwasher. So I went around looking at all of the little tags and all of the appliances in this store. I believe it was a Target. And every one of them, without exception, that I was able to see said, made in China. So I commented on this to, uh, 
to the guy who was selling this dishwasher and he immediately started apologizing for this. I said, no, 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 no need to apologize. I understand this, but uh, you, can, you can see this is uh, quite something. So there's the chart I was talking about in terms of manufacturing. Well, continuing with this conventional wisdom, there's also, uh, this isn't going to surprise anybody, but a, a really startling emergence of massive trade deficits in the United States since the late 1990s. So if I could just give you some visual representation of this. Until the uh, mid-1990s, the United States trended towards trade deficits, but they were small relatively small as a percentage of GDP. Nothing that anybody would pay any attention to to speak of. And here we are beginning uh, in the late 90s and certainly accelerating during the period just after China joined the WTO again. So a, a, a correlation that may not mean much, but you understand, uh, to this massive increase in, in, these, in this trade deficit in, in merchandise. Um, and it's continued up and down through the recession and everything since then. But the point is, this is a challenge to economists to explain, and we haven't done a very good job of explaining that. There's sort of half a dozen uh, hypotheses out there, but one of them is that China entered the WTO, and maybe it really was the combination of the competitiveness of Chinese exports along with the ability of Asian economies to invest in the United States in financial instruments that drove this massive increase in the trade deficit and, uh, and with it the current account. So whether you want to think of this in economic terms or you want to think about this as just a matter of politics, it's inescapable, right? It's just inescapable that that has been a big change. And of course, there's been a corresponding rise in the U.S. trade deficit with China from $84 billion just before they joined the WTO to about $375 billion uh, last year. That's two-thirds of the American trade deficit. Now, I think if you understand what drives these kinds of macroeconomic imbalances, this is a really poor way to think about trade policy. Um, and in fact, if you try to measure what the real trade imbalance between the United States and China is, you would first uh, worry about the services part of the current account. And of course, we have a fairly large service surplus with China. That brings the trade imbalance down. And, if, and then if you think about the value added implicit in the trade, that probably drops this drops at another 30 or 40 percent. So really the true imbalance is maybe half this measured size. Uh, try telling that to a reporter and seeing how far you get, okay? This is really uh, an issue of optics more than the actual economics of it. So all this feeds the narrative that China is sustaining unfair trade practices. I think that view is overestimated in the public's mind, but there's certainly quite a bit of evidence for it. Um, and then finally, uh, we have conflicting stories in the United States among the public about gains and losses from major trade agreements such as NAFTA. So NAFTA advocates will tell you that the United States has gained massively from this, in, this integration of the economies. The automobile sector certainly believes that. It's a much more efficient sector because of its ability to generate North American production networks. Um, advocates or, or opponents of NAFTA will tell you that in fact there's been massive job loss, which is part of the Trump campaign. What economists unhelpfully say is that NAFTA has maybe increased American GDP by one half of 1% over 30 years, in which case you think, okay, this, this is a little hard for us to, 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 to be real positive about. Uh, and as with Brexit, there seems to be a growing dissatisfaction with and distrust in remote policy elites like trade negotiators and the World Trade Organization and TPP. Um, the uh, U.S. Trade Representative is, is on record many times these days as saying uh, that, that it's a mistake to allow the United States to have WTO rulings interfere with our sovereign ability to make policy, no matter what that policy is. So that's a big question. And then finally, what do complex regulatory issues in these modern trade agreements like intellectual property rights, investment services, liberalization achieve for ordinary citizens? Uh, you know, not a lot, probably. So this is my last set of comments about this question about American people turning inward. How true is all of this conventional wisdom? And that's what you hear about Brexit. It's what you hear about much of Western Europe. It's what you hear now about the United States. Well, going into the 2016 presidential election, the majority of Americans were actually quite pro-trade. Let me show you this. <laughs> 
the dark green line is the answer, positive answer. Do you think foreign trade is an opportunity for the United States or a cost to the United States? And 58% is the highest that number's ever been. That was in 2016, and there's no evidence of any kind of a decline since that time. And in terms of actual opposition to trade, it's actually been going down in recent years. So that's a bit of a puzzle. And the same thing is true about attitudes towards legal immigration in the United States. In fact, the top diagram on the left, that the share of Americans, about 59% in 2016, who, thinks, who think that legal immigration is a benefit for the American economy is at its highest level ever. So what we have is a conventional wisdom that suggests Americans are turning in one direction and polling results that suggest it's not clear whether that's true or if it's true exactly why they're doing that. So <coughs> what might be going on? What's changed? Well, political opinions in the United States, uh, uh, like el elsewhere, have become highly polarized, perhaps more than at any time since the 1930s. I'm sure you've read a bit about this, but if you were in the United States, you would, uh, you would recognize it immediately by going onto social media, watching various different kinds of uh, news, uh, and uh, sort of hearing commentators. They're everywhere on television all the time, making uh, lots of claims that are probably not true. But to oversimplify these differences, rural towns and manufacturing areas that have experienced e economic hardship are feeling stress. Urban centers with rapid growth and booming employment think that trade is wonderful. There are more people there. And so that's why the uh, there's support for trade is fairly clear. Lower educated blue collar workers uh, under, again, employment and income stress versus higher education professionals who thrive with technological change. Religious and social conservatives versus lifestyle progressives. And finally, younger voters who are largely more open to technology, trade, and immigration versus older voters. And in the United States, as in elsewhere, older voters vote at a much higher percentage than younger voters do. So these attitudes don't necessarily get translated into politics. But just to give you a sense of this, if you look at the diagram on the bottom on the left, uh, this is, again, attitudes towards uh, the benefits of immigration and the blue line essentially are what we call blue voters in the United States. They come from uh, democratic leaning or democratic states and they're up there at 78 percent. Whereas the red line is what we would call Republican leaning voters and their opinion about immigration is very negative. So there is this polarization going on that's partly political but it's driven by all kinds of geographical and economic differences uh, that's quite important. And then this one over here has to do with age differential. Again, this is about uh, uh, immigration, attitudes towards immigration. The youngest people in the United States are very pro-immigration, whereas the older pe oldest people are, are not. And so consequently, uh, younger people don't vote so much. Uh, that's a big part of this issue. Uh, but it does suggest that there is reason to pause and think about whether there really is this inward turn in politics or at least in, in, in opinion in the United States. Okay. So, some implications, and then I will get on to trade issues. Political polarization, at least in the United States, but I think this is generally true, generates fragmentation of political interests and candidates. So it's quite possible to have skeptics about trade, immigration, globalization to be in the minority but if it's a strongly held minority, uh, opinion among a large enough minority of voters, and they have a high turnout, you can certainly get uh, the kind of outcome that we had in 2016. And it correlates with wider held concerns, distrust of elites, exhaustion with policy stagnation in, 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 in Congress, concerns about inequality, and so on. So all of this led to a greater acceptance of the Trump campaign platform for just a different approach, not just about trade, although re rebalancing trade was a big part of the campaign, but about, about uh, how Congress is supposed to work and sort of in interaction among individuals within social media and all kinds of issues that came up. So, you know, I would say his election may have been unique, but it, was, it wasn't random. 
uh, there was an appetite for change in the United States, even among some of these blue state voters. Uh, okay, so with that background, this fragmentation and so on, let me turn to at least my view of, of what seems to be going on. What are the principles that animate trade policy in the Trump administration? Again, this is my opinion. I was in the administration for a while, but, but what I'm telling you is, is, is my opinion based on reading and experience. This is not a statement about anything formal in the U.S. government. So what is this new approach to trade? It can seem chaotic. I imagine if you followed, you, it's been going on, you see that it's pretty chaotic. It changes day to day, but, uh, but nevertheless, there are some principles, some pillars that we could think of as America first that seem to drive this. One, national security interests do take precedence over trade relations. Uh, again, there's no formal statement that that's the case, but that's my sense of it uh, from having uh, you know, been involved in some discussions and, and reading about this. Uh, and that's important. It's very important because it means that uh, trade policy can be undertaken in a context that is subordinate to international relations or national security issues. Competition for technological leadership uh, is about both national security and future market shares in leading industries. This is a, a big issue in Washington and it's hardly just the Trump administration. Uh, pretty much all of, uh, of official Washington believes that China is engaging in mercantilist technological industrial policy and uh, it's probably beyond after time or beyond time when China needs to be confronted about this. Um, Everybody in Washington who's involved in trade reads this document from Beijing called Made in China 2025, if you're familiar with it, that sets out this blueprint for the industries that China intends to dominate by 2025, which of course are exactly those industries the, the Americans currently think that they have a substantial lead in. Uh, and so there's a lot of concern about, about what this might mean. U.S. manufacturing and mining workers have paid too much in the minds of some uh, of the burden of globalization and need protection. And again, you know, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to argue against these points because if you're a steel worker and you've lost your job because of excessive capacity in steel production in the world, a lot of it coming from China, there are reasons to be uh, unhappy about the way things are going. One corollary here uh, is that to shorten supply chains by bringing assembly operations in manufacturing back to the United States, is, it's actually a goal. It's not a cost. Now, an economist would say this is inefficient, it's going to be costly, and you know, there are columns by economists, uh, hundreds of them, uh, about NAFTA, about saying that, in fact, uh, if, in, if, if, if there are sort of significant tightening of the rules of origin in, in NAFTA that bring supply chains back into the United States from Mexico, this is going to be highly costly. Uh, and I think many in the Trump administration would react to that positively. Trade agreements uh, and the multilateral system uh, place too many constraints on U.S. policymaking and not enough on countries that maybe don't follow the rules. And you can see, again, this is uh, aimed at China. And finally, I guess there's one more. The rules-based approaches of past administrations uh, to particularly uh, China, but, but other countries as well, uh, was ineffective at changing behavior. Um, so now maybe confrontation and uncertainty will achieve better results. And six, the US can negotiate better bilateral trade agreements, including in Asia, than regional deals. Now, I, I would say, and just my view, this is sort of the set of principles, such as they are, about what is uh, at the bottom of, of current U.S. trade policy. So you can certainly look at those and think that they amount to a strategic new vision. There's nothing terribly new about a lot of it uh, when you think about it. But uh, its implementation so far has, has been more bluster than actual intervention. We don't see a lot of actual intervention except in the steel and aluminum tariffs. But even there, uh, there are so many exceptions now to them, uh, it's become a transactional issue more than an actual trade policy issue. So can it work? Uh, some arguments, uh, pro and con, and then uh, get into the sort of international relations kind of questions. So there are some promising ideas here, some potential advantages from this approach. Uh, 
modernizing some of the old trade agreements. Uh, NAFTA, for example, uh, has been overdue for some time. NAFTA was written at a time when this is before e-commerce, before digital trade, and, and many, many other things that, uh, that could be done better in this context. Um, now, that's not entirely or even maybe very much what the Trump administration is hoping to achieve in NAFTA. There are some other things that they, they're after as well. But, you know, rethinking some of these issues, not so bad. And maybe raising pressure, even if it's unilateral on the WTO, uh, might unblock some of the really rigid positions there. The WTO has become almost irrelevant. It really hasn't had any success in any international negotiations in a long, long, long time for lots of reasons. But partly it's about the, the positions that different countries take at the WTO, and it just, just prevents uh, uh, progress altogether. And so maybe even raise, raising this pressure, but also you know, working with China in this context could set the stage for advancing that system. And then the big one, I think, uh, bolder attempts to open markets and restrain industrial policy, especially in China, may bear more fruit than prior attempts have, have, have achieved. I don't know. This is a big gamble. This is a, this is a, a situation where the policy that may be undertaken is literally a gamble, trying to get some change in the attitudes in the policy stance uh, of what is seen as a technological competitor uh, sooner rather than later. If, if it's successful, it probably would benefit both countries. I mean, a lot of what the United States is trying to do is to open up a lot of the Chinese market to services, to investment, and so on. I can tell you that this strategy is pretty popular in the United States, and, and even among economists and business uh, individuals who are willing to talk about it uh, publicly, you'll see that uh, the view is that you know, China has been playing in this context uh, a pretty one-sided uh, strategy that uh, has been costly. Uh, so in this context, if it's really about strategic trade policy, then some other big country needs to get involved uh, and change the payoffs that uh, are seen in, in, in the Chinese government. And maybe this will work. I mean, this is, this is in essence what, what the, the strategy, the risky, the gamble is. I don't know that you would get anybody in Washington to put it in those terms, but effectively everybody's hoping that that's what comes about. Huh. But disadvantages, questionable ideas. Uh, I do think that Trump's, uh, the, the administration's trade policy has been to, so far somewhat misplaced. And, uh, and based on poorly informed policy uh, ideas, and that's not sustainable. It really isn't. So some examples here. This emphasis on bilateral trade imbalances as a measure of unfair trade, it's ideological, not analytical. Canada escaped because its bilateral trade deficit surplus with the United States was under $10 billion. Mexico's was over $10 billion, so Mexico is an unfair trader and Canada isn't. This is an odd way to think about international trade policy, to say the least. It irritates trading partners. So this is sort of a misguided focus on outcomes rather than actual market access, which is the, which is the goal. Temporary trade protection is not likely to help industries that need to deal with long-term structural problems. So the U.S. really needs policies to address bigger problems. The fact that we don't generate enough skills, we don't train a lot of workers well enough to, to thrive in this kind of an economy uh, and all of the adjustment problems in the United States. These are structural problems that, that we should be investing in in a big way, and, and I don't see much of that yet. And then because of NAFTA, because of the Korean uh, arrangement that was sort of disrupted, I think countries have become leery of bilateral negotiations with the United States. You probably have seen what the Japanese have been saying about whether they're willing to do a bilateral deal with the United States, which is coming, uh, I think, forward future in, before, before too much long in, longer in the United States uh, some, some, some real intent to try to convince the Japanese to do a bilateral arrangement. I'm not sure that that will come about. Um, and the administration seems intent on trading trade policy as a series of transactions to be negotiated, not a real strategy. Uh, so if that's the case, then I don't know that it can work terribly well. And finally, many objectives I think would be better achieved by cooperating with other major economies with similar concerns. So two big examples, both involved with China, there's the overcapacity in steel. Uh, the OECD has been working on this issue for a long time. Uh, I'm not sure that unilateral imposition of steel tariffs by the United States will deal with that capacity problem. Uh, 
um, but some coordinated arrangement might have. And then there's the, the issue of Chinese high-tech industrial policy. Uh, I, you know, myself, when I was uh, talking to people in Brussels, uh, often they would say, this is important. We would like to partner with you on this kind of a question, uh, but it didn't happen. And finally, the failure to link trade policy with international relations, in my mind at least, is short-sighted. Pulling out of the TPP was a mistake on many levels, e even just market access uh, for American agri agriculture was a big deal in that arrangement. Um, I don't know that that's going to happen again, but the whole thing about the United States pulling out of this major trade agreement that, that really uh, will set the terms of competition in Asia, for, some, for a generation at least, uh, was remarkably uh, well, isolationist, I'll put it in those terms, but, but a surprising decision, to say the least. So, these problems suggest that elements of the strategy may be unsustainable. Uh, so we're getting a pushback now. The Trump administration has discovered that the U.S. business community generally opposes significant trade barriers or changes in trade agreements. Just a few examples. The exclusions from steel and aluminum tariffs I've already mentioned. The remaining targeted import flows, I think, Japan and Turkey are the two countries remaining, uh, and China for, with their small amount of U.S. exports. Um, that's a very small percentage of U.S. imports that had been targeted by these tariffs, so I don't really know how this is going to uh, end up protecting the American steel industry. Automobile sectors uh, pushing back hard in NAFTA, as I've already mentioned, agricultural export interests opposing uh, the potential lost market access in Mexico and in China. Uh, and they remain upset with losing Japanese markets uh, in the TPP. So, yes, we'll find out in November in the United States with the midterm elections uh, whether this gamble is paying off as a matter of politics as opposed to international relations. Okay, we still remain in a situation of flux and uncertainty about what will happen and why. So if I'm sitting in another country's capital wondering what American trade policy is all about, uh, I don't know. I read the paper like everyone else. So with all of these headwinds, to me, uh, and this is sort of where I'm moving with this long stuff on the United States, with all of these headwinds, it seems to me unlikely that the Trump administration can sustain a protectionist agenda, push it very far, or keep it going for very long. And that means that uh, what we could call routine trade policy is likely to revert to standard trade management, anti-dumping cases, subsidy cases, WTO complaints, maybe some occasional safeguards tariffs, which I think uh, in the end, uh, and I'm, I think sooner rather than later, that's going to be largely indistinguishable from trade policy uh, from prior administrations. But some of these newer elements are going to remain, and they will be an irritant, I think, in this part of the world, even after the Trump administration. So it, it would be a mistake, I think, to conclude uh, from anything I'm saying or anything that's been written that, that even though the Trump approach, administration approach to trade policy is transactional, it's kind of chaotic, uh, it varies from time to time and place to place and product to product, there are some underlying issues that really do animate lots of people in Washington. And so whoever becomes uh, the next president, and it may continue to be the Trump administration for another four years, um, there will be issues that remain after the Trump administration. And you can think of this, it's not my phrase, someone else's, as conditional cooperation, which simply means that in some key areas, further cooperation with the United States is likely to be conditioned on positive responses in key countries, most importantly China. So enhanced investigations and caution about foreign takeovers of US-based technology companies and facilities. Uh, it's going to become increasingly difficult for Chinese enterprises, especially state-owned enterprises, to acquire American technology. And not just in terms of just buying American technology companies, but also greenfield investment, uh, in technologies, also uh, having access to sensitive exports. I think you'll see uh, some increase in the export control regime. And you may even see China-specific or state-owned enterprise-specific guidelines within CFIUS emerging. Uh, and I suspect, 
again, strictly my opinion, that this will not happen only in the United States. I think you may see this in Europe as well, and Canada, and maybe Japan, and Australia. Uh, because there is a generalized concern that, that, that these technologies uh, are dual-use technologies. It's about security. It's also about the future of the technologically oriented economy. Uh, and maybe we're selling these things too cheaply in that sense. A greater tendency toward reciprocal treatment of high-tech investment restrictions. You know, the president has said this many times. If we can't invest in China, maybe we're just going to make it a reciprocal arrangement here. They can't invest in the United States. I don't think we're anywhere near that situation, but I, I do think you might see uh, a greater tendency towards reciprocal arrangements or reciprocal guidelines ab about high-tech investment restrictions. Uh, and then active and more forceful engagement with China to try to get a more balanced playing field in these technology sectors. Um, and, you know, active and forceful kind of means what they're doing now. Okay. And you may see uh, bilateral or regional negotiations on elements of key U.S. interests becoming more uh, prominent in the region, data protection, e-commerce, intellectual property, already very prominent issues. I do think from the standpoint of American high technology companies, the United States having taken itself out of TPP was really problematic because all of those things existed in the TPP such as it was. Uh, some of the IP agree, uh, rules have been scaled back, some of the e-commerce stuff has been changed, and some of the investment stuff as well, but nevertheless, the United States is going to try to get back into the TPP, whether it's into this administration or the next one, and it's going to have this problem, which is it started with a really good arrangement from an American standpoint, and now it's going to have to get back into trying to renegotiate that same situation. All right, so the bigger picture, this routine trade policy stuff and these newer ideas, not so new ideas, but newer incentives and, and mechanisms, routine trade policy like that really can't address the major long-term issues in U.S. Asian trade, and neither can I, so uh, I'll just sort of say a few things that in broad terms about them. I don't see personally how the United States can really pivot away from Asia. The mutual economic interest between the United States and Asia are just enormous and far too important to try to rearrange the gravity of economics in any sense, if you could even try to do that. And they're going to continue to grow. And that's just a fact that, that the Americans and the, and the Chinese, but, but countries in Asia, are going to have to try to arrange, uh, come to grips with. At the same time, it seems to me, you can see lots of evidence of this in uh, in public and private statements in the United States and Europe by corporate leaders, that the enthusiasm of international businesses for operating in China is slowing down pretty rapidly. Partly because the economy is slowing down, to be sure. Partly because wages are a lot higher, to be sure. But it's, I think a lot of it has to do with just finally deciding that the risks you take to operate in the Chinese environment aren't worth it and that you're going to find other arrangements, other ways to try to deal with, uh, with getting into the market. And China, as a result to me, faces a potential area of era of, of lagging competitiveness that it's going to have to try to think through. So to me, take both of these sides of this thing, China and the United States need a strong and sustainable bilateral economic relationship. And everybody says that, but I think it's, uh, it's important, but not inevitable. And of course, the rest of Asia needs both of these countries to be reliable economic partners. Uh, you know, sort of running a business in Vietnam or Hong Kong, uh, it's kind of a, a crapshoot in many ways out there. So let me sk sketch out for you what I see as a semi-optimistic future. I'm actually pretty optimistic about where things are going to go. You may disagree. So given this set of mutual economic interests, how might we see policy evolve over the longer term? Well, one, it may not happen in the current administration, but it may. Uh, the U.S., I think, inevitably is going to re-engage in the region. Uh, at some point, the government is going to develop a clear strategy for working with the region, with economics at its center. It's uh, kind of remarkable. 
that there's so little leadership in, in, in the government of the United States focused on Asian economic questions. Uh, there isn't a statement about policy, uh, economic policy. But at some point there has to be a strategy of that kind, and I'm, I'm sure that that will be forthcoming. Of course, the United States is already reconsidering the decision to withdraw from the TPP, and, and then so I think it'll come back and try to attempt a beneficial renegotiation. And the TPP countries that are in the CPTPP, I sure would benefit from the expansion of the market. So the numbers are, without the United States, the sort of economic advantages of the CPTPP are worthwhile, but they're a lot smaller than you're going to get with the bigger market. And, uh, and to re-engage with regional institutions such as APEC and the Asian Development Bank on, on what might be investment and trade norms in the region, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, scope for that. And finally, to continue to address unfair foreign trade practices in the region without violating international commitments. This is the sort of important thing to be seen as a reliable trade partner. And we have our own domestic investments to worry about. For its part, China could do a better job of cooperating. I don't doubt that this is under discussion in a big way, uh, but, but uh, we'll see. So one thing would be to offer clear signals of an intention to open markets and reform restrictive investment rules and technology transfer policies. Somewhere between really doing that and saying that China will do that is a place where I think the Trump administration is willing to declare victory. Nobody knows where that line is, uh, but, but, but I think that, that something is going to have to be made uh, public and I hope could with some commitment there. Uh, certify compliance with existing WTO commitments and, and recognize that uh, China, its eventual designation as a market economy uh, depends on more domestic openness uh, than, uh, than it currently has. And then there's some scope for collaboration. Maybe complete negotiations between the two countries and a high quality bilateral investment treaty. I don't know if you followed these negotiations at all and they sort of kind of suspended, I think. Uh, but I think in Washington, uh, a signal that would really matter is a bilateral investment treaty with, with Beijing that really does have enforceable investment uh, protection in it. Address continuing problems of overcapacity that you're all familiar with, invite foreign protection responses, try to avoid that outcome, and to sustain a continuing dialogue within the region on expectations and norms in trade and investment. So that isn't just TPP, it would be the RCEP and, uh, and you know the, the One Belt, One Road initiative, which I know very little about. I'll probably get questions and I'll tell you what I think can, but, uh, but I, you know, I'm trying to, 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 to make it clear that, that, that whatever that infrastructure being built is, there are expectations about, about non-discrimination and market access, even in an initiative of that kind. And then jointly between the United States and China, reinforce the centrality of the multilateral trading system in settling their disputes. Okay, but maybe not. It's my last slide. Then we'll take turn to questions. China could certainly choose to reject this conditioned cooperation and uh, continue using market restrictions and industrial policy to try to achieve this dominance that its documents are looking for. I suspect whether. Donald Trump is president or not, and whether we're talking about now or 10 years from now, that would invite uh, more trade policy responses from the United States and increasingly maybe from the European Union and Japan. And that would place considerable stress on the multilateral system, uh, perhaps even encouraging uh, the breakup of the WTO, which is something I think we all don't want to see. So both the United States and China and the region stand to lose considerably from that outcome. So to say something that is obvious but needs to be repeated many times over. Trade wars are not good and not easy to win. I don't have any prediction about which of us might win a trade war, other than to say, if you understand the economic logic behind trade wars, we're all going to end up with a lot less trade and a lot more headaches. So I'll stop there and ask for questions. Thank you.
Hey. Hey. Chinese politics. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question is, um, as I think about uh, these issues and the potential for some solution to the U.S.-China trade war, um, I try to think of some degree of two-level games, not as sophisticated as Putnam was my teacher at Michigan. So, oh, okay. Um, not as sophisticated as his whole argument, but the basic assumption that you need a domestic constituency, you need to bring along your domestic constituency to win. Um, and, and when I look at Xi Jinping, you know, because that's I pay more attention to China, so he clearly has an incentive to meet some of Trump's requests because, as you said, it will enhance reform. And there are reforms that he really, we believe, we're not sure he, but there are certainly strong sectors within China that would like to reform investment policy, finance sector, SOEs, all that kind. But yet he faces a very strong resistance, I think, from netizens, from state-owned enterprises, from agricultural sector, all kinds of things. So how do you see this from that level you know, do either side or either side put together a winning constituency? Because now you even suggest that Trump, I thought Trump had a winning constituency. Mm -hmm. Now you say that in fact he really doesn't. Um, so how on, do you solve this? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I mean, I think strictly on the issue of this concern about Chinese industrial policy and high tech, that Trump does have a, cons a constituency, which is essentially the entire American government. You entire Europe is well. And Europe as well. So that issue is not going to go away. And I, I think it might, and this is, again, strictly my, my take on the issue, that Xi Jinping may want to take that, that question seriously. Um, but as far as organizing the rest of uh, Chinese economic uh, and political interests, I don't know much about it. Um, I think that there probably has to be some statement that in some future time, China will, if it does, goes through these reforms, achieve these objectives, and become a regional or global leader in setting international trade rules. And that may be the kind of political document that would work. Uh, nothing like that would work in the United States. Uh, so I think you're going to see sustained pressure on these particular specific questions. But the stuff in the United States about being highly protectionist just because we want to be, I think that's where that's not likely to be sustainable. So, not a very good answer to your question, but uh, <laughs> it's a hard one. I mean, <laughs> there's something back here. I, think. Uh, I would like to ask actually, one way to solve the U.S. trade problem is to, to lower the uh, U.S. dollar, right? The, um, the Trump administration has been talking up the dollar. Would that be one of the solutions? Um, and it's question number one. And question number two is. Uh, would the uh, U.S. Uh, trade protectionism against uh, China push uh, China to develop the regional, I mean, say, one belt, one row, or you know, uh, uh, more type of Russia, or you know, things like that, into a regional uh, trade uh, region, rather than uh, taking on an easy option out to give up uh, in this trade uh, policy to the yeah. U.S. Yeah. Well, on the exchange rate question, I, I, I'm pretty sure still that the United States is committed to a fully floating exchange rate, uh, that it doesn't view it as a way of generating a, a competitive advantage in trade. Um, I'm a little surprised that on occasion uh, Treasury officials or someone will talk up the value of the dollar. It seems a little odd to me, but the dollar is rising. Uh, these days, I think in part because interest rates are rising, they're rising because we've had this tax reform that sort of puts a lot more uh, investment into the system, if you will, less savings. I, I, I'm, this is sort of some, something I was kind of alluding to that's surprising about the economic policy of the administration is they don't seem to think across issue areas terribly well. So the tax reform uh, for reasons I just mentioned, is going to, in my mind, over some period of time, raise the value of the dollar and generating a bigger current account problem. Um, and in that context, that might actually increase some pressure in Washington for more trade protection. I, I don't know. That's just, just, a, just a, a guess. And 
what, but again, in terms of your, your, your question, I don't really see even a mechanism other than dialogue uh, for the United States to try to drive down the value of the dollar and make that matter in terms of bilateral trade with China. So I, would, I, don't, I just don't see that as a solution thing. Um, so is the Chinese reaction to American and maybe European pressure going to be to try to dominate the region and erect, erect its own sort of sphere of influence and whatever norms that might suggest? Uh, I don't know. It certainly might be a reaction that, uh, that could happen. I think other Asian economies would be a little cautious uh, about that outcome because uh, you know, if that ends up with ef effective exclusion from the European and American markets, that's not a good thing. If it ends up with, 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 with norms and rules that uh, are a little bit less market-oriented, then that's not necessarily a good thing. But my own, own take on this, and you know, it's, 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 it's possibly naive, is that ultimately these two massive markets need each other for lots of reasons. It isn't just comparative advantage, it's also size, it's also sort of the potential, once we get beyond these current stresses for technological co cooperation and dealing with a lot of global issues out there. Uh, so uh, I guess that may be naive, it may be over-optimistic, but I, I think it would be, it would certainly surprise me if that was the reaction of the Chinese uh, authorities to do that. Yes. So I'm here again, I'm a local Right. Uh, you stated that uh, you didn't feel and you don't like mixing up national security with uh, trade relations. No. But the U.S. Defense Department has announced earlier this year that uh, the enemy is now China and Russia. And given that, uh, I suppose, very few people would believe that China will separate national security from trade relations, that is certainly not reflected in the 2000 years of history. Now, and if, I would say most people would believe that China may take Trump's threat both in national security and trade relations seriously. So how would you, have, how would this affect your assessment of, I mean, your semi-optimistic <laughs> assessment of the future? I didn't quite mean, uh, although I can, I can see why you would have, have interpreted it that way, I didn't quite mean that they, they're separable. Uh, so much as I meant that security interests would take precedence whenever there was some trade-off involved. Um, and so uh, I think that is likely to continue. Uh, and so if the Chinese response uh, to whatever the United States is doing is to sort of tie those things more tightly together, I imagine the Americans respond, will respond in a similar way. But saying that the steel tariffs or some agricultural intervention or something like that can be done without too much concern about national security is one thing. Saying that uh, the United States is going to just sort of continue with its essentially laissez-faire approach to technology and technological dynamism and export controls and all of these kinds of things uh, is another. And I don't, I don't think that's going to be the case. The United States is getting more and more involved in those questions. And so if that matters for your business, it, 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 I'm, I am. And again, uh, you, got, you all may have very different views of this than I do. But I, I just think at the end of the day, the international business community is so integrated uh, across borders uh, and it's going to be so costly to unwind all of those international production networks uh, and to deal with what would happen if you started going down the road of very regional kinds of trade agreements uh, and you know, highly restrictive rules of origin and everything else, which may be what happens, I, it's possible, uh, that I think at the end of the day, that's just not as likely to happen as the alternative, in my mind. Hello, I'm a, my name is Jim Sitko, I'm a partner at EY here. Um, hey. well, thank you for your remarks. Sure. Um, a question regarding the most recent um, move by the Trump administration, who is the Commerce Department, banning ZTE, which is the big China uh, technology company, from buying U.S. components, technology components. 
in your view, is this part of the Trump negotiation tactic, or is this simply uh, enforcing Commerce Department rules against sanction violations that may perhaps have been enforced in prior administrations? Well, uh, again, uh, let me emphasize my opinion. <laughs> no one in Washington. I think it's a bit of both. I'm, I'm certain the Commerce Department was making the case that there are some of these uh, sort of enforcement questions involved. But ZTE is one of the Chinese companies that's seen as a rapidly growing competitor. Um, obviously, Qualcomm is not happy <laughs> in any way with the outcome, and this may be part of what I was referring to. With They're now making a very large issue of this case in Washington. Those, that, that decision may get reversed, who knows? But uh, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, that's, you can think of that as a sort of a strategic shot across the bow in this context. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Cliff, I'm a uh, blockchain uh, wow. advisor. Uh, I would like to ask you to uh, comment on blockchain, how that might help uh, trade relations, if, it's, if you have any... Uh, wow. Uh, only the most poorly informed so blockchain, I, I assume what you're getting at is the idea that because of these very secure registers uh, that can't be really necessarily tracked by governments, that this could be sort of pro-trade by reducing tr transaction costs quite a bit. Is that sort of what you're talking about? It can be tracked about? by anyone. It's hmm. public. Hmm. It can be public Yeah, I'm sorry. So that there's an uninformed statement on my part. But I, what, I, what I meant by that is you don't really need to have the sort of intervening middle transactions, even including by customs officials in this context, right? Um, so I, I mean, I think that blockchain could be a real element for expanding trade. Uh, I don't doubt that in getting to that new future that governments are going to be very interested and very involved in trying to figure out how they might be able to regulate that activity, both for security reasons uh, and also for revenue reasons, but uh, there's probably a, a, a good future for it. Uh, a long way away in my mind, but I, you, you know the technology way better than I do, I'm sure of that. Yeah. Some other stuff, yeah. Uh, which I think has uh, like a more political reasons. Could you go into a little bit more detail about Well, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, secret about it by any means. So, so um, NAFTA in the campaign was a stalking horse for all of these issues about trade. And so I think the Trump administration is under some pressure to get the agreement renegotiated in a way that favors locating facilities, production facilities in the United States. So what that comes down to is a rewriting of the rules of what constitutes a North American product in a way that favors the United States. So if, I don't, I don't have the exact numbers because they change, but, but as of some months ago, the current NAFTA, if you want to count as North American uh, content, it depends on the product. It's more difficult in textiles, less difficult in, in automobiles, that's sort of a political economic outcome. But what would happen in manufacturing is if you raised sort of North American content rules from whatever they are now to say 45 to 50 percent, then what the Americans would want is that at least half of that content has to be in, in the United States. So it, that, that's, a, that's an additional layer of protection or incentive to produce in the United States. This has always been something that the Canadians and Mexicans have said, we don't want to go there. Uh, you can understand why, because it sort of eviscerates the, the idea of a free trade agreement in, in an important way. Um, and I don't think they've gotten beyond that point yet. Uh, another issue that I, that I think they, the Americans have given up by now, or should, if they haven't yet, it soon is, is the idea that, the that, that, that NAFTA would be subject to revisitation and renegotiation every five years which is very unpopular 
in the North American business community because you want a longer investment horizon than that. Uh, a couple of other things like that that are sort of more hidden from the, the conversation but quite important in terms of getting to the final stage. Thank you. My name is Shana. I'm from BBBA's Bench Bank. So when you talk about this sensitivity of this protectionism in the U.S., uh, in your mind, what will be the event of something can stop President Trump? Or like the midterm election, if uh, they continue to be doing this uh, protectionism things, and then they could get punished by this midterm wow. election? Or uh, because of what we look at the President Trump's administration, we find that the, before we tend to believe some people near to him could affect him. But uh, now it seems that uh, and everyone doesn't have the same idea of him being driven out of the government. So that's why I have this question. Well, so, do you have I, I, so economists are terrible at making predictions. <laughs> and they're especially terrible at making predictions about politics. <laughs> so who knows? Uh, I think the midterm elections are going to go badly for the Republicans. I don't think that means Donald Trump is going to be kicked out of office or anything like that. I'm, I'm virtually certain he'll complete his four-year term. But if the midterm elections go badly for the Republicans, he won't have a lot of enthusiasm as the presidential candidate. And there will be uh, other candidates who come along to try to challenge him. And you know, a lot of people, including myself, have, have, have often wondered if he really wanted the job in the first place. Uh, so maybe that would be a nice outcome for him, doing four years and that would be that. But, uh, but who knows? I, I think the thing that would slow down momentum uh, politically for this kind of interventionist stance in trade is a really bad outcome for the Republicans in November. Because then what, what the American people would be saying is, um, I mean, it, there's so many issues with Donald Trump. <laughs> who, know, who really knows? But, 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 but I think what they'd be saying is that we elected you to sort of change the nature of politics. You haven't. What you've been doing is costly to us. Uh, and so we're going to change gears again. Um, but whether that's because of tax reform or just all of the social media stuff that's so strange, who, who knows? But I think if, if that... If there's a bad outcome for the Republicans, a, d a, distinct, a d definitively bad outcome for them, you're going to see them not supporting a lot of this policy any longer. I mean, the Republicans traditionally have been the big business party that has been supporting uh, a lot of the trade agreements out there. And now this fact that they're so willing to walk away from NAFTA, from the TPP, is a big surprise. And I, and I think if you talk to a lot of the senior Republican leadership, they're not happy that that's what they've been forced to do. So probably looking for a reason to go back that way. To the time constraint, now we uh, only have on the last question. Okay. Not that privilege, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm Robert Allen from NTU yes. Strategy Advisors. Uh, it's one thing to say that the US Americans may be looking inward, but there's one area that they can't look inward, and that's the atmosphere. Oh, that's sure. climate change. Sure. And clearly there are some indications that one of the reasons Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement was that they felt it was bad for the U.S. But, and they've begun to make it more difficult to import solar panels. And other countries like India have seen, well, that works, so we'll do the same thing. Um, do you think that it a, was a trade issue? And do you think that the U.S. will go back into the Paris Agreement? Well, I can, uh, for just five seconds, put my old State Department hat back on because at this point, I would be required to point out, to correct you on something, <laughs> the United States has not pulled out of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement uh, is due for renegotiation, believe it or not, right after the, the, first, the end of the first four years of the Trump administration. Uh, and the United States is still in it until that time, at which point, President Trump says, if we don't get a much better deal, that's when we'll pull out. So. Those of us who worry about climate change uh, kind of hope that the timing of that is fortuitous. Um, but having said that, the decision to pull out is both 
uh, a political promise being made and kept to the coal industry. And if you want to think of that as an economic outcome or a political outcome, feel free. I don't think it's in any way going to resolve the problems of the American coal industry, in or out of the Paris Agreement. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think it was an economic decision. It's popular in parts of the country. It's very unpopular in other parts of the country. And again, I think this is something that the Republicans are going to have to grapple with in the, in the midterm elections because this decision is not popular in the populated centers of the urban parts of the United States at all. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, time is up. Uh, it has been a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.